Okay, uh, we're recording today. Uh, let me put this up onto the screen. In fact, there we go. And, uh, do that. <clears throat> there we go. There we go. Okay, so uh, right, Republic uh, Book Six. That's what we're going to talk about today. Uh, it's about it's a the, the book six and book seven are a big turning point for the republic. Let me uh, go back out here. Um, the first half of the republic has to do with uh, the nature of philosophy and uh, the nature of education, how to make uh, people how to how to raise the youth into being good citizens. And then the end of the republic, the last couple of books, is where they get back to this discussion of the tyrant and whether the tyrant who gets everything, uh, sort, of, sort of a version of the story of Job, whether that person's really happy or not. But a key part of the Republic are books six and seven. Notice books six and seven off from the center of 10 books. It's the sixth book and the seventh book. And I would just point out here, if you're into this kind of stuff, it's there in Plato, so it's kind of fun. But if you take the Fibonacci numbers, right, the the uh, the golden ratio, as Plato used to call it. So you take a uh, length and you multiply it by 0.618, actually, and you get uh, a ratio um, that we find throughout nature. And Plato's really into this, and he does have this built into the Republic. So one thing I would point out then is that this uh, sort of crescendo of the sort of high platonic theory of uh, the duality of form and matter is really laid out at this point, probably figured out really quite precisely by Plato, uh, the analogy of the sun and the analogy of the divided line at the end of book six, that's the book we're going over today, and then the famous analogy of the cave at the beginning of book seven. So we're gonna do book six today. Book six has two parts. Uh, the first part, which is again, ending this discussion of the education of the uh, philosophers of the guardians. And they finally have gotten to the point, as, as Socrates points out here, that what we're talking about, uh, the guardian needs to know about the good, but then we need to, ourselves to talk about what the good is. He says, he even says lots of people have this nice rhetoric. You know, a lot of people do read Plato at the level of rhetoric, because if you're not seeing what the philosophical arguments are, then it just sounds like very uplifting rhetoric about being um, in love with truth and attuned to beauty and this kind of stuff. And so you can sort of read it as this kind of uh, rhetoric, but that's pretty empty. There, there are always arguments that if he's going to talk about the good as the source of value, he's got to tell us about sort of what the good is. So let's get to this uh, text. Um, the book six of the Republic and take a look at what it says. Let's see, here we go. Um, a little more intro here. Again, we have an intricately structured composition. He, he, he wrote a lot of other dialogues and he really meant for each one of the books of the Republic to be like one of these other dialogues, which have names of their own, like the Phaedrus and the Theotetus and the Philebus and stuff like that. Um, but uh, and so he meant for them all to be freestanding, but also all to be part of this um, composition. And Plato's favorite metaphor for his art as a writer was weaving. He was really uh, struck with the idea of weaving different strands together. He has a whole different approach. It's not really exactly fiction or nonfiction, even. That is, all of the characters are actual historical characters. Um, but uh, you know, it doesn't occur to him that he would make up a character to symbolize something. He's telling the story. Uh, as I say in, in, in the second bullet point there, you get uh, the end of that discussion that goes up to about 507A, and then you start to get the, and then you get the analogy of the sun. The analogies of the sun and the divided line. I'm going to give you a very basic intro to that. Uh, I mean, obviously, we could do some sort of full length presentation on the format or distinction. And I, I mean, I'm sure I'll get around to that. Um, but I'm going to give you basic uh, introductions to the um, analogies of the, the sun and the divided line. And then, as I said, we, the rest of the book gets back to um, this discussion of whether the tyrant uh, is actually going to be able to be happier than the just man who's considered unjust. 
And there's a rather arresting and I think extremely important discussion of aesthetics there in those last couple of books, books nine, book eight. All right. So anyway, that's just sort of you are here kind of getting getting situated. What's happening here is we're going to come up to and then take a look at those uh, central analogies at the core of the Republic. So, um, so I want to linger, though, first on this first half of, of it, where we're getting this discussion of uh, what good philosophers are like. We got in book four a discussion of the parts of soul. In book five, we have this quite fantastical discussion of the um, imaginary city. And now in book six, you really get, I think, the confrontation with the question as to whether or not anything like the Republic, the Calipolis, as it's called, could be uh, instantiated in the real world. And we'll talk about that a little bit in a few minutes here. So obviously, a uh, good philosopher is going to be able to recognize universals. That's sort of what the whole thing is about. In the um, as far as philosophy is concerned, in Plato's Academy, there was a lot of work with the geometry and, and logic and other uh, techniques for learning to recognize universals when you saw them. Uh, and so that's sort of that exercise of the formal part of soul that characterizes the philosopher. Uh, being in touch, that is, with the more fundamental level of reality, because the universals are a more fundamental level of reality than, uh, than individual things in the material world. But remember, the Greeks are virtue theorists, and so he also says there are also good uh, human characteristics, other than these purely transcendental formal characteristics that obviously the Platonic philosopher has to have. But they also have to be a good person, and we're going to have to get into that because the question is, you know, rationality seems as if it's a sort of pure thing independent from the material world. So, so when we get to virtue theory, I think that's an interesting question. Uh, and the spirited part, or what we call it discipline, the part that really moves the body has to favor truth over falsehood. This is going to be necessary. So he starts to outline. So Socrates is outlining these sort of qualities. And then, um, and Plato, you know, always has a way of sort of being a step or two ahead, even though you're always trying to, you know, tear down the old, the old guy. Um, but Adimantus, uh, Plato's older brother, Glaucon's older brother, says, he, he just tells the truth, because Glaucon is, is Socrates' student, not Adimantus. Adimantus is the older brother. He's just there. He says to Socrates, look, Socrates, uh, you know, I find, you know, when I listen to philosophers, it's very clever and they've put together this big thing. And I, I certainly see that I couldn't overcome their arguments that they've constructed. Uh, but, you know, I got to tell you, they're not particularly, philosophers don't have a particularly great reputation. They don't have a reputation for doing anything that's particularly valuable. And they're also not uh, held up as particularly paragons of virtue either. So, you know, this is really, again, this book six is saying, how realistic is any of this kind of stuff? How much of this stuff could possibly be in the real world? Which is a real life ethical question because it also gets to our motives or Plato's motives. So we think that Plato is just giving us uh, a thought experiment that we look at him in one way. And if we think he sort of really means it, then we look at him in another. Well, these worldly virtues, um, Socrates surprises Adamantus by saying, you know, Adamantus, you're right. I mean, actually, you know, you don't really see a lot of philosophers who are obviously super valuable or super really highly esteemed people. And he points out something that's very important, which is all your worldly assets. You might be healthy, you might be wealthy, uh, worldly and wise, right? Well, not wise. Uh, whatever it is that you've got, Whatever asset that you've got, it can, if you're going down a bad path, then those assets are going to help you proceed down the bad path. If you're going up the good path, they're going to help you that way. They are not in themselves goods. I think that's actually, you know, a, a pretty compelling uh, argument. You can say, well, I want all these things that help me advance my intentions. But remember, there's this metaphor in the uh, Republic about the book, about the ship. The navigator can take the ship anywhere. He knows how to steer it. But there's got to be a captain who knows where should we go? What, where's the best place to go with the ship right now? Why are we going there? That's the, the wisdom part. That's different from the craft part. And so all of these worldly assets are, are, are how to do something. You've got your strength. You've got your health. You've got your good connections. You've got your 
you know, your good family. You've got whatever it is that you've got that's helping you along through life. But if, if, if your goal is something bad, then it's just going to help you do the bad stuff. So it's not going to help you at all. And I, I think that's quite persuasive. And he explains to Adimantus, third bullet point, that, you know, there's a people, the best people aren't going to go into philosophy. And it's pretty obvious why they're not going to go into philosophy. Um, and this is still certainly an issue today. I, as a philosophy professor, would never try and talk somebody going into philosophy because if they're good enough to do philosophy, they're probably good enough to do a lot of other things. It might be more fun and they might make a lot more money, quite frankly, don't tell, uh, don't tell mom and dad. <clears throat> um, and at the same time, last bullet point, and back to that ship analogy too, since the, the, the person who, since the wise person is understanding these universal principles that are not obvious, that are not sort of part of the material empirical uh, survey, then they appear to be talking about just nothing. I mean, they're, they're talking about transcendental things. So, so not only are they not seen as having any particular claim on authority as to what to do next, but they also look to be particularly unsuited to that. Um, okay, and, and sort of populism. Now, there's a very powerful passage here. I think, you know, uh, it might be time for us to get over some of our sort of maybe Cold War distortions in the way that we read the Republic. Uh, an obvious example coming from early in the Republic is he clearly thinks that it's getting lost in materialism and expansion, uh, economic material expansion that is the undoing of the originally peaceful and pure city. Uh, he, he clearly is a mid-millennial spiritual teacher in his warnings against materialism. Another interesting thing that he says here in book six is because we all know that Socrates doesn't like the sophists because the sophists make the weak argument the stronger and the philosopher loves only the truth. But Socrates also point, points out here that the sophists aren't really as bad. They're not so bad compared to the forces of, um, of conformity, of peer pressure, of public pressure to believe things. Uh, he says people out at the camps, the soldiers out at the camps are, are chanting their chants and getting indoctrinated. That's what he says here. And remember, he also says, and this, this, we'll also talk about this a little when we get to the divided line, there's a dialectical relationship between the individual and the society. The individual, the, the society is the ground of the individual for Plato. He's an organic social theorist. These human beings are naturally found in social groups. And uh, so he thinks that you can't really talk about an enlightened individual unless you've got an enlightened society. He also thinks that there's, um, uh, you know, you can't get to an enlightened society without enlightened individuals, which is why he does have a revolutionary program. There has to be an intervention to break the cycle of conformity and to steer the collective soul towards the vision of the good. And so you're going to have to have some kind of revolution. Uh, that's the implication. And this third bullet point, then this very famous metaphor of the beast it talks about politicians. They learn how to handle the beast. The beast, of course, the Leviathan, the beast is the society, the masses. And so, but what do they do? They don't, they don't impart virtue to the beast. They don't change the beast's behavior. They just learn how to positively and negatively reinforce and in general patronize the beast. Eventually, they actually are the slaves of the beast. Democracy, right? Pandering to the passionate desires of the many. Uh, and, you know, the, the metaphor of the beast, I mean, what it tells us is they just see the beast as a beast. The beast is just to be used and manipulated and stampeded around uh, for one's own, you know, for one's own benefit. In terms of advancing the polis, you know, there's no vision of advancing the polis. Um, so, yeah, political reality and, and political philosophy. As I say, it is an ethical question that is, it gets to our ethical evaluation of Plato, our evaluation of him, uh, if, we, if we think that uh, what's the, the sort of liberal-minded way to think that I usually do think of him is that he's giving us a counterfactual thought experiment and that he understands that uh, according to his own theory, which is the duality of form and matter, you're never going to have a perfectly formed thing that's involved in the material world. And in fact, 
he gets he not only agrees with that, but he even gets Glaucon to agree with that in the Republic and a couple of passages. And we couldn't we wouldn't expect to actually you, you couldn't ex- expect to actually achieve formal uh, perfection in the material in a material incarnation. That's the whole point of the teaching, really. Um, on the other hand, you know, he did go out to Syracuse and try and get the tyrant Dion. You know, the thing about uh, this, the, since he identifies democracy with the passions of the body, uh, then he thinks that some kind of, even a, even a tyrant might be good in as much as, remember, he's, you've got to have some sort of radical intervention, according to his theory, in order to rationalize the world, in order to achieve the rational revolution. So, um, so he does actually think that these are ideas that ought to be uh, experimented with and instantiated as they might be uh, in the real world. As I say, second bullet point, the right, the, the theoretical answer, which he acknowledges is no, because humans are part of the material world. That's the human condition that, uh, that John Milton is talking about in Paradise Lost, straight ahead Platonism, right? Between the beasts and the angels. Part of you is angelic, the other part beastly. That's the original sin to be incarnate. So, so really down at the very heart of it, it's very clear enough that there's no possibility that you could get the city of God or, uh, right, or, or the Holy Quran or Plato's Republic uh, or a Marxist utopia instantiated uh, Hegel's end of history in the world. Not going to happen. Um, and so, as I say, he's, he's well, just the last bullet point, then democracy defined as rule by the material appetites of the many cannot be a vehicle of, of rationalist reform. Democracy is hopeless because the premise of democracy, according to Plato, is that uh, you're going to be uh, pursuing the material desires of, of the masses, of the group. Uh, tyranny, by the way, is not actually a state. We talk about these as different kinds of states or regimes, but the tyrant, uh, the, there's an argument that democracy isn't really a state either, since the passions themselves aren't unified in any way. Uh, but in the case of a tyrant, then definitely you don't really, uh, that doesn't actually rise to the level of being a state, which would be some kind of relationship, uh, reciprocal relationship, I guess, between people. Pleasure and desire and the good. And this is one of the really fascinating things in the Republic. All through the Republic, we find this discussion. Um, this first half of the Republic, we find a lot of this discussion about the nature of the good. This is ethical theory, right? What is, what is the source of value? And here what we have is a um, real source of value. So think of he, when we say hedonistic and ethical theory, just meaning that ultimately pleasure some kind of positive, positive nature of experience is going to be the source of value or the reason why we think some things are good and some things are bad. Um, it's a redu- that's a reductive theory. That is, I'm in a body, I have certain kinds of experiences. Some of the ones are the ones that a being like me wants to have, other ones not so much, and that's really what's going on. And that's why I say some things are good and some things are bad. Um, but he says, even those people admit that there are bad pleasures, I get meaning in the sense, I suppose, of self-destructive pleasures, overeating, drugs, uh, excess. Aristotle likes to talk about excess a lot. Um, and, but meanwhile, there are people who are the transcendentalists uh, who want to say, well, no, there's something that's good, which uh, um, overrides pleasure. But Socrates says, most people don't, you know, they sort of owe us an account of what the good is. I mean, they really should sort of tell us about what then, uh, what is good. And he proposes that that's what he's going to do. And that's what he does proceed to do. And again, these analogies, which we find, you know, in this book, at the end of book six, the analogy of the sun and the analogy of the divided line. Um, now, uh, everybody wants the things that really are good says at 505D. That's a really interesting and I think very sort of suggestive remark. Everybody wants the things that really are good. Is it right? I mean, he says, we don't, we don't say, I want the things that are good to me. I don't want the things that, that are good from my perspective. We say we want the things that really are good. We want to insist, uh, what, what, what's an example? I think of some of my... Um, young fellows who I work with and they like to argue about what's the best music and what's the best band. And they're all really like Glaucon in the Republic. And Socrates points out that 
he knows about all the latest dance rhythms and keeps up with all that. A lot of young men like to do that and talk about what's the coolest band and the best music. And they're certainly not coming to that conversation from an attitude of, well, this is just what I like and whatever you like is okay for what you like. I mean, they're really actually rather passionate about the whole thing. Um, so the last bullet point, let's listen to the argument here. Um, it's an argument that we find in several different places in Plato. We don't say something's good because it's beautiful. Uh, we don't say the beauty causes the goodness. If you think of the beauty as the thing that's causing me sensory pleasure. So, right, I'm getting this beauty. And so that I say, okay, that's sensory pleasure. So that's what's good is. So the reason I say this thing is good is because it is beautiful. And he says, we say something's beautiful because it is good. He says, there's something good about it, which is the thing that makes it beautiful. That sounds right to me. Um, he gives a couple other examples. In the Euthyphro, the question is, is something holy because it's loved by the gods, or is it loved by the gods because it's holy? If it's holy because it's loved by the gods, particularly remember these fractious Homeric gods uh, of, of ancient Greece, then that looks arbitrary. It just looks like whatever the god loves. And there are different gods who don't all agree on things. And for example, I mean, even if there were only one god, if it were just whatever that god happened to contingently like, and their likes, like everyone else's likes, were subjective, then that would mean that there wasn't any rational basis to any kind of values at all. Which I suppose is what the hardcore theist thinks, I guess. Um, Whereas it's got to be that it's left by the gods because it is good, in which case the consequence is that those gods are not omnipotent, right? They can't, for example, they are bound by what is good. I think that's the point. Um, and in the Phaedo, remember Simeus, uh, one of the young students, wants to say Simeus and Sebes. I think they're exchange students from Macedonia or something. But anyway, they, uh, Simeus says, look, Socrates, um, I, you've convinced me that your soul is something different from your body, but look, the music is different from the lyre, but if they destroy the lyre, uh, you certainly destroy the music. But Socrates comes back with what I think is one of the most important arguments in all of Plato, which is that no, is the fact that the universe is a harmonious place. That's why these musical instruments come into being. And, you know, it's not that there isn't any music until the musical instruments appear for heaven's sakes. And that's the way the good works. Um, so that whole argument is, th those arguments are, I think, deep. And deep. All right, now let's quickly go through these two uh, famous analogies at the end. Uh, they, not because they can be quickly dealt with, but rather the reverse. I mean, you know, obviously we have to come to it. So I'm gonna go over them quickly and show you sort of what's going on about them and then we can study them more. So the analogy of the sun, Plato really loves analogies and he runs his analogies out really far. But here we can be pretty quick. The sun gives off light. And since there's light, then things become visible. Things are visible because of the light. The light is what makes the things visible. And because it's a world where things are visible, now Plato doesn't talk about evolution here, um, but, it is, but it is nonetheless on his view, because it is the kind of, of world that's got light all through it, such that things are visible, that you can have this power of vision. It is the kind of world where you can have the power of vision, a visible world. Otherwise, vision would not be possible. And so intelligible, that is intelligible as members of a category, roughly, you know, that's the roughest way of putting it, uh, organizing something under a concept, if you will. Um, so it's, it works the same as light. But what is that? The sun imbues the world with light so that you can see all of the objects. The good imbues the world with formal organization, which makes the objects intelligible, identifiable. Um, Aristotle's the what is it question about the thing. And although, second bullet point, although we can sense the sun in this way, sort of see it indirectly, we can't look directly at the sun, it's too much. And we also only see the good indirectly through its interest, through its influence on the perceptible world, on the formal organization of the perceptible world. 
And that's what's meant by dialectic in the uh, divided line, for example. Third bullet point about theory of value, where value comes from, the nature of value. The sun gives off light. Darkness is the absence of light. Think of the, the sun, the source of the light, in the middle of the darkness, farther away from the source of the light you get until you finally in complete darkness. Formal organization, um, giving off intelligibility until you finally get far enough away from it, all you have is chaos and disorganization. Chaos and disorganization is identical with badness. Formal organization, Apollonian organization is identical with goodness. This is the aesthetics as well as the ethics, uh, as well as the psychology of Plato. The last bullet point, let me just uh, say this. Uh, I hope it's clear enough. You have to learn a lot more about it going on studying the Republic of Plato. Uh, it was the modern philosopher Kant who said that uh, things like universals and mathematical relationships, time and space, are projections of the human mind onto the world. That's not what Plato is saying. Whether Plato is right or wrong or whatever you think of Kant, you know, it's just as a matter of interpretive understanding, important to understand that Plato is making metaphysical assertions. He doesn't think he's making assertions about the ideas that God put into our head or our mental representation of the world. That's all Cartesian, Kantian, modern rationalism not Plato. you got to take your Plato straight or else you're not understanding what he's saying. Uh, the divided line. Now, again, trying to make that simple, um, it, we are, again, incarnate. So we are subject to illusions. Most of what we see are mere reflections, reflections of formal organization, consequences of formal organization. And then we start to represent things and we get even farther away from uh, from the reality of things. So this divided line, I mean, it's a sense of a sort of upward movement where we're kind of lost in delusion. We get very typical uh, spiritual teaching of the middle of the first millennium BCE, I might add. So uh, we are caught up in the material world, suffering from various illusions about things that we think are important that are not important, things that we think are true, which are just our projections. And if we can concentrate our mind on higher transcendental things uh, in this ancient Greek classical context, um, thinking about mathematical relationships, logical relationships, looking at that transcendental purity, then uh, we can cleanse our souls. The second bullet point is something that, again, is really lost to modern people who have a lot of Cartesian ideas, uh, and it's key to understanding the divided line analogy. Mind coexists and is coextensive with intelligibility. Intelligence and intelligibility are of the world of becoming. They come to be and pass away together. The Cartesian picture is you have this otherworldly sort of mind. It's an observer mind. And it's kind of there and unaffected. It's independent of uh, the matter and what's happening. In Plato's view, you don't have you don't have a mind-body distinction. You have a form-matter distinction. And Plato thinks that the human mind and self also comes to be and passes away. And not only that, but as they say, mind is dialectically coextensive with its objects. So one actually is not just using an unused portion of one's mind if one um, evolves into someone looking at more transcendental topics. One actually becomes a being that is different from a being who doesn't look at those transcendental topics because that being just is part and parcel to um, thinking those thoughts. And the last thing I'll say here, uh, again, just as a note, in case you didn't know this, the divided line, uh, I think I mentioned before the golden ratio, uh, take the length and multiply it by point, uh, uh, 0.618. And um, you know this from painting also. And, um, and also you wanna look at um, Plato's uh, platonic, the platonic solids. And uh, so th there's a lot of complex numerology involved in the divided line. And I'm, I'm not gonna pack that for you now, but I'm just gonna flag that so that um, you can see that there's this other really interesting and diverting 
um, aspect of looking at Plato, which is looking at these ideas he has about numbers and the Pythagoreans and so on. So, all right, now I think I do believe that that is it. Yes, that is the share. So Plato's book says, <laughs> I hope that you see that really, um, again, very typical of um, literature from written in the fifth or fourth century BCE. This, is, this was written by Plato somewhere around 375 uh, BCE before the Common Era, the uh, first part of the fourth century uh, BCE. And these writers, see their project as, um, to use a fancy word from theology, soteriological, but what that means is you're supposed, the reading is supposed to impart discipline, it's supposed to be a practice, it's supposed to change you. Reading is supposed to change your life. That's why we have a stereotype of classical philosophy as being the study of the good life, because classical philosophy sees itself as being a kind of guide to living a good life by introducing the reader to certain kinds of discipline and making them think. So the right way to read any book of the Republic is that way, to look at the ideas that it has for your own reflection, uh, for your own evolution, to think about what he's saying about authority, about politics, about society. All right, so I'll leave it at that. I'll give you um, some links. Looking here, perhaps you're interested in that material from the first half of book six. Uh, or perhaps you want to dive in and start looking at the format or distinction that we're studying in the analogies at the end of book six. Okay, so we'll talk about that. We'll do, we'll, you know, we'll do one and then the other. Okay, I'll see you next time.